Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's November 6th, 2020 program, Reimagining Monuments. This is the ninth program of our 2020-2021 programming year. My name is Scott Coltrane and I'm the City Club President. Support for the City Club is provided by our members and sponsors. You can become a member of the City Club at our website, cityclubofeugene.org. Our programs are always available on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page and are rebroadcast on public radio station KLCC 89.7 on Mondays at 7 p.m. We have both business and in-kind sponsors, including our diamond sponsors. Kaiser Permanente exists to provide high quality, affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. Support comes from the University of Oregon. Since 1876, UO has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health is proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond. As your hometown health care partner for more than 80 years, our mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high-quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. And we would also like to acknowledge the generous support from the City of Eugene and from Lane County. On to today's program. Today's presenters will clarify and challenge the mainstream notions about what are monuments and memorials. We think of these as public structures intending to convey a message. In recent years, we have watched or read about the destructions of monuments whose messages have been rejected. Our awareness of the richness of cultural perspectives has broadened. We have become more creative in how we memorialize messages. Consider Prees Trail and the Ruth Bascom Riverbank Path System, the sculptures of Rosa Parks sitting at the bus station, and of Ken Kesey reading to his grandchildren. In the spirit of the mission of City Club to build community vision, John Weber, Michael Geffel, and David Harrelson will encourage thinking about new ways to convey messages and build visions that can bring us together and inspire us. I would like to thank Mary Layton, a former president of the City Club, and a current member of the program committee for organizing today's session and serving as a moderator. John Weber is the executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. He has curated exhibitions and publications about West Coast national and, and re, national and international contemporary art. Weber previously served as founding director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz, as director of the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore College, and as curator of education and public programs at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. He began his career as an artist and served as a curator of contemporary art at the Portland Art Museum. He earned a BA from Reed College and an MFA in visual art from UC San Diego. Michael Geffel, terrestrial practice, is a registered landscape architect, a professor of practice at the University of Oregon, and program manager of the Overlook Field School. He's a founding member of the Making a Monument Committee, which is facilitating a public engagement initiative around the historic sites of the UO pioneer statues. 
with research broadly focused on experimental landscapes, Michael's principal method of study uses field experiments and temporary installations to explore how landscape design can adjust to social and ecological processes over time. He earned a BS in geography at the University of Oregon and an MLA at the University of Virginia. David Harrelson is the Cultural Resources Department Manager for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. He's a Grand Ronde tribal member from the Bean Menard Sengreta family. His research interests include ethnobotany, contact era Pacific Northwest history, and traditional land management through the use of fire. He has worked in the field of cultural resources for 10 years, and before that, worked as a wildland firefighter. He earned a BA in history from Lewis and Clark College. On to today's program. Thank you, Mary. I'll turn it over to you. In this program, we hear from three people who have given a lot of thought to the meaning of monuments and memorials. Each speaks from a different professional perspective, from long or more recent interest in the subject, and from different life experiences. One way or the other, all will touch on the point that monuments and memorials send messages. Who chooses a message? Who decides how to express it? Who pays the cost of sending it? The answers tell us a lot about whose opinions count and whose values get celebrated in a community. It seems therefore useful to introduce the speakers not only by telling you their credentials, but by telling you how I found them and how my membership in social groups shared the sh shaped the search. This will give you some ideas maybe about where and how to expand the search for monumental ideas in the future. The quest began as a way to reboot city cl club planning after election day. Fellow program committee member Kate Karen Knudsen recommended that we do something special to get us out of the competitive turmoil. Statues are disappearing from public places. This is not new. In 1776, the revolutionaries melted down a statue of King George III and turned it into bullets. We decided to try to get our energy moving in creative and unifying directions with a program about how monuments and memorials direct our attention to the people, values, and events that epitomize our ideals. I've enjoyed seeing Ellen Tyson's sculptures in public places, and I know her from Roundtable Club, so I started by asking her advice for the program. She recommended John Weber. She knows him from their work at JSMA. Scott Clark, another roundtable friend, told me that landscape architects concern themselves with this topic. So I asked Roxy Thorin, head of the UO Department of Landscape Architecture, and she referred me to Michael Geffel. Michael has been working with colleagues and students on issues surrounding the comings and goings of pioneer statues. Finally, I asked Jason Yonker, who lived across the street from me, his job at UO administration is to keep a mutually rewarding balance in the relations between the sovereign indigenous nations of Oregon and the university. Jason is also an anthropologist, so he pays attention to what people do about their values. Jason sent me to David Harrelson, who is the manager of cultural resources for the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. First, we'll hear from Jeb John Webster, director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art and himself, an artist. Hi, it's John Weber, actually, not Webster. Webster, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to speak principally today about um, monuments in my intro comments, but a certain amount of what I'll say does have to do with memorials, too, and I have a few thoughts about those, so perhaps we'll get to that in the dialogue more. Um, I think of monuments as primarily uh, public pronouncements that are not particularly personal. They're not private exp expressions, the way a lot of what we think of as modern or contemporary works of art. Um, they function as a kind of public pedagogy in relation to the past. 
And they do something that we might think of as memory work. They help us remember events, um, people, histories, and they also seek to direct our memory and our understanding of history in very specific ways. Um, they, they seek to instruct us to how to remember the past. Um, you could say that they really want to enforce uh, an authoritative image of history, and you say they want to be believed. Um, yet, as with any history, uh, we, the audience, as the people walking by the monuments, need to ask um, who's speaking here? Um, whose version of history is being represented? Whose pedagogy is this? And, and to what ends? Um, likewise, if I'm looking at a monument, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking, um, you know, who, who's not speaking? who's not being allowed to speak and why. Um, we should be asking ourselves, what are we told to remember here and how and by implication, what are we being asked implicitly or explicitly to ignore um, or forget? So clearly, based on what I'm saying, um, monuments, I don't regard them as something that's value neutral expressions of history. And quite the contrary, I think in a in a positive way, at times in a negative way, unintentionally, they want us to honor and celebrate a particular vision of history. So they're inherently political, and I don't think we can get away from that. I don't think that any of our discussions about how to find a, a constructive, positive path moving forward should ignore the fact that monuments, in some sense by nature, have a, a, a political dimension. But that doesn't mean they're inherently bad, and I don't consider them inherently bad. I also don't consider them inherently good. Um, I just think that their job is to argue for a certain kind of a, of a vision. And this is true, you know, for any entity. It could be the city, could be the state, national government, could be a university, could be a school district. It could also be a community organization. They're, they're funding a monument with the, the hope of um, promoting their, their point of view. Um, that's just, just what they are. We have other words for forms of public expression that are not doing that, and monument, I, I would argue, is not one of them. Um, I also think it's interesting to think about at this moment as monuments are so much in the public eye and the question of, of uh, what should they be, what should they say, that we should remember that our notion of a monument um, and in a really stereotypical way, we could say, you know, a, a man on a, a man on a horse. And in fact, it's likely to be a white man on a horse. And that this is a culturally specific kind of memory work. And not all human societies and cultures have created things we would recognize as monuments. But all human cultures have ways to do the work of memory, to remember the things that are important to us, um, our traditions, and to talk to ourselves about the past. And so storytelling traditions, uh, dances, um, theater, architecture, and often very elaborate forms of object making that are invested with cultural memory and cultural significance um, might play this role, but they don't necessarily look like um, what we think of as in um, a sort of post-European culture, if you will, as, as a monument. So um, I, I think as, you know, and on campus we're now, we're starting to talk about where do we go next and folks in the Humanities Center and actually Jason, whom you mentioned, is on a group that's thinking about this. And we're thinking about a lot of different kinds of things, not necessarily any, even anything physical. It might be a gathering, it might be a performance, it might be um, stories and ways to share them as a way to think of what a monument could be. And there was a very interesting project I want to mention. It was in Philadelphia called the Monument Lab. It was about a two-year project with a number of different galleries, and they, they solicited participation. They had about 250,000 people participating and about 4,500 different suggestions as to what citizens of Philadelphia would want for a monument, what they would want to memorialize and, and how. And that's a, the catalog for that just came out, and I recommend it to anybody who is interested in this. Um, I'd also say that um, as our understanding of the past changes and understandings, plural, there are many understandings of the past, it seems entirely logical and acceptable that we would want to continue to change how we depict and therefore remember the past. Um, at UO, pedagogies change all the time. It's inevitable as new faculty members arrive and new students arrive. We're always rethinking history and constantly finding new aspects of it that have not been thought about, researched, or interrogated. 
So history is not static and we seek out new voices. And in, in museums, you know, we, we constantly rehang the art on our walls. You know, we take things off view, we put things on view, we put them next to different things and all of that changes their meaning. Um, so it's always actually struck me as very, very sort of peculiar. And I was on the uh, Portland Arts Commission a number of years ago, and it always struck me as strange that in the public sphere, once we put an object down, there's this notion that it has to stay there forever. You know, we don't do that in museums, basically. We, we move things, we, we have new ideas, we change them, we listen to different voices. And, and so the fact that we, we feel this way often about um, monuments or public art too, I found uh, curious personally, and I, I don't actually agree with that idea, even though I don't like to see things necessarily destroyed. I do think you can move them. I do think you can take them away. And I also think there are histories, frankly, that we don't want to honor. And building a monument is honoring something. And there are things we want to remember and that we need to remember, but we don't want to celebrate and we don't want to honor. And so how do we do that? I think that's an important question that needs to be grappled with now. And I think there are a lot of different ways to think about um, how we do this work of memory. Um, the AIDS quilt comes to mind as a particularly interesting, it's not a monument, I think it's a memorial, but it comes to mind as a, a uniquely creative way to do the work of, of, of memory. And um, I just think there's a lot to be said about it and a lot of creative possibilities that are there. Uh, thank you. Michael, what have you been, you've been seeing a lot of campus art, you've been talking about it, thinking about it. Uh, what is it you're seeing? What are, how does that follow on what John just said? Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and thanks again for the invitation to discuss this topic through the lens of landscape architecture. Um, I'm very honored to share the stage with the other speakers. Uh, as a professional service, landscape architecture distills and manifests values through the physical form of landscape. And during its brief history as a profession, uh, dating back to Olmsted in the mid-19th century, landscape architecture has been deeply concerned with city planning and the design of public space, as well as the monuments contained within it. Um, so I, I'd like to begin this presentation with a little historical context on uh, monuments in the U.S., and in particular, the rise of the American City Beautiful movement and all of its associated monuments. Uh, so the City Beautiful movement guided U.S. urban planning in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as a response to poor living conditions in American industrial cities and borrowed extensively from European cities, in particular French urban design. So recurring design elements that we would recognize include the axis, neoclassical architecture, as well as monumental civic structures. Uh, important landscapes from this period would include the National Mall, a continuation of a previous plan for Washington, D.C., uh, designed by a French planner. Uh, and that represents some of the aspirations of our young country in relation to older colon colonial powers. Um, but further south, another example from this period can be found on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy. But instead of a memorial to Lincoln, Richmond's monuments celebrate Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Jefferson Davis. Uh, so from my perspective, relationships between monuments and political power structures are very closely knit. Um, and that's what unites both cities, both Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia, is that these monuments are an expression of identity. Uh, and a particular identity, the identity of who is in charge. And this is also very close to the French prototype from which these City Beautiful boosters borrowed from. Uh, following the French Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte was responding to the horrid living conditions in Paris, when in 1851, he instructed Baron Haussmann to connect and unify the different parts of the city into one whole and make it more beautiful. And the new boulevards, tree plantings, pedestrian promenades, and underground sewers most certainly improved urban life and continued to define Parisian living. They also made it easier for the military to control the city by creating clear navigational axes through the old quarter. This hub and spoke system was 
punctuated with monumental architecture along the major axes and intersections, none more famous than the Arc de Triomphe, which became the rallying point of French troops parading after successful military campaigns. And that monument is both an expression of na national identity as well as military power, a military power which was also in conflict with its own people. So at this point, it's not too difficult to understand, I think, how those Confederate monuments in Richmond were so contested over this summer and have been for quite a while, and how they became important sites for recent Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, many Confederate statues were also erected during the City Beautiful era with fundraising and support by the Daughters of the Confederacy, and this group's influence extended far beyond the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, the group's mission was to preserve the mem memory of the Confederacy at a time when many former Confederate soldiers were dying of old age. And in navigating the political approval process to erect Confederate memorials on public land, the statues also serve as a reminder of who remained in charge. So with all of that context in mind, I think it's important for us as Oregonians and Eugenians to reflect on our monuments from this period and to question their role in shaping Oregonian identity and to problematize the power structures that they represent. And so locally, that would force us to look at the University of Oregon pioneer statues that were recently toppled by activists. The pioneer father was installed in 1918 to face Johnson Hall, the building which houses university administration. Both structures sit at the center of campus in the middle of the historic quad. The pioneer mother also faced Johnson Hall, but was erected about 15 years later. And the statue centrality on campus is a clear expression of the importance of pioneerism at the U of O, as well as the state of Oregon and Washington and Idaho for that matter. The statues don't represent historical figures and therefore they can't be judged by their individual actions. Instead, they're representations of that narrative, the pioneer narrative, a narrative that permeates Oregonian identity through memorials, cultural landscapes, and of course, 90s video games. We can, however, judge the monuments by what was said during their dedication, an account that was unearthed by UO historical history doctoral candidate Mark Carpenter and is available at hiddenhistory.uoregon.edu. And in 1919, the president of the Oregon Historical Society made a speech stating, the Anglo-Saxon race is a branch of the Teutonic race. It was and is a liberty-loving race. It believes in the protection of life and liberty and in the rights of property and the pursuit of happiness. This race has large powers of assimilation and its great ideas of liberty and of the rights of mankind caused other races to become a part of it. So it became a people as well as a race. So in this way, the statues become more problematic as generic representations of the pioneer narrative because that narrative is wrapped up in manifest destiny and Euro-American colonialism. So, Pioneer depictions are so ubiquitous in the Pacific Northwest, I think it has been easy to forget what is symbolized. And certainly these monuments represent the struggles of Euro-American immigrants on the Oregon Trail, as well as the opportunity offered through the Homestead Act to those willing to risk the journey. But I suspect, suspect many also recognize how this symbol is offensive to the indigenous peoples of Oregon, because the Homestead Act depended on their forced relocation to tribal reservations, reservations which were in turn taken through treaty violations. And we should also remember the black exclusion laws in the state's original constitution as a reminder that the pioneerism rests upon white supremacy and reflects a specific racial identity. And it also just so happens that those monuments were erected while the KKK was rising in prominence in Oregon another reminder to new immigrants about who was in charge here, who had rightful ownership of this territory. So these points have already been made by the faculty of the UO Native American Studies Program and the Department of Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies in the Eugene Weekly piece, why they had to go. And I invite uh, any listeners to revisit that article if you missed it. Um, but as, and so to reflect some of uh, John's points or reiterate, as time passes, 
so do our perceptions and values change. And along the way, it, along the way I think it is very important that we also reckon with our monuments, a process that promises to be uncomfortable. In a way, they're, they're a black box. We take them for granted until we open them up and see what's inside. But I'm inspired by how these sites have hosted political activism and the many creative ways that individuals have recontextualized monuments to tell a more complete narrative, that they don't necessarily need to go into the dustbin of history. So in Richmond, images of Breonna Taylor are projected on Robert E. Lee, linking the institution of slavery to the recent murders of innocent African Americans. In Albuquerque, the foot of the conquistador Juan de Oñate statue was removed, a retelling of the atrocities that he inflicted upon Acoma men over the age 25. And in Bolzano, Italy, the words of Hannah Arendt are inscribed over a fascist frieze, reminding us that nobody has the right to obey. So following, following the recent toppling of the pioneer statues on campus, a committee within the Department of Landscape Architecture was formed to explore how our professional expertise could facilitate a design di dialogue around the statues and their historic sites. And we hope that our training can assist the broader UO community visualize alternate representations of pioneer history that give form to evolving values. And I think that that also reflects a lot of the points that John is making. Uh, that there are ways of recontextualizing monuments to tell a larger story, but then also to create new monuments and new memorials based on the stories as we understand them now. And so next month, we're kicking off the initiative with a series of listening, listening sessions. And on behalf of the Making a Monument community, I would like to enthusiastically extend an invitation to join us in this process of discovery. Um, We'll be sharing informa contact information uh, in a week or so, um, but we're very excited to explore as a larger community what these narratives mean and what really is embedded um, in a, a pioneer statue. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Now, David, you, you, you're, you have a different perspective uh, on the pioneer experience and the whole idea of monument making. What have, what have you got to share? Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and um, share some thoughts. Um, in just basic summary, uh, we need more from monuments. Um, they can be so much more. And I wanna talk about some examples of that. Um, one is that I think that inherently there is authenticity of place. And for monuments to uh, reach that greater threshold of something more, I think that celebrating authenticity of place um, is an important and a valuable exercise. I think that place has this ability to be a unifying thread. And within our community, we use the term landcestor to try to introduce this idea to people who live in a place where our ancestors have lived for over 500 generations but yet they feel a, an intimate personal connection to that place because they call it home the same way that we call it home. It creates this linkage. The people of a place, even as those people change, all have a commonality and a tie to that. And so I wanna see that as an inspiration for monuments. Um, as, as a tribal person, that looks like wanting people to consider um, tribal teachings, practices, worldview as inspiration. You know, for us as tribal people, our basket designs, our art itself, um, you can see the patterns that are written in the landscape, right? You look at a basic triangle chevron pattern, and then you, you know, a beautiful morning like the sunrise that so many people saw today in the Willamette Valley, you look off to the Cascade Mountains and there's no doubt about where that pattern came from. And if you do have a doubt, all you have to do is look at a fir tree and look at the triangle cut shapes that come off the sides. So these are examples where those shapes, those patterns, they're intrinsically authentic to place. And um, drawing that sort of inspiration, I think that there's themes that cut through time that uh, are relevant across peoples in space. And I think that that's something that if we're going to do this improved work, uh, we should focus on that. 
I really value John's comments and you know comparing looking at monuments as like practices in memory work because I think that is very true for us as tribal people. Um, our histories aren't necessarily written in traditional monuments the way that we might think of today or written in books. Some are told in stories, but what we like to say is that it's actually written upon the landscape. Our stories are written upon the landscape. So you, there might be a story that goes with something, but what you're supposed to do is go to prominent vantage points and look out across the landscape and tell the stories that relate to those landscapes. Of course, there's inherent teachings about cultural life ways, living life in a good way, having balance, um, you know, all of these aspects come into that and it's memory work, it's the ability to do that. So sometimes view sheds are an extremely prominent or important aspect of this work for us. Um, I mentioned abundance and our ancestors manage for abundance. Sometimes it gets confused um, with being sort of mystical in some way, shape or form. People you know, think of sustainability, think of natives, but there's a lot of scientific inquiry that was a part of that work as well. And for the practices of this, I just wanna introduce a very strong example of that, which is that you know, my ancestors are Kalapuya, or the people of the Willamette Valley, um, and camas is an extremely important traditional food. If you drive along I-5 in the Willamette Valley in June, you'll see beautiful fields of blue flowers, and those are the camas plants, and you can eat the bulbs. And what's really important or valuable um, that early settlers and others didn't realize is that you can't just harvest everything and eat everything that you find. What you do is you dig down into a clump of camas, and you take the big bulbs, and you leave the small bulbs. And what happens is over time, you spread it out, and it becomes more abundant, because now the bulbs aren't in competition with each other and they can spread out. But it goes even further than that in that it's also good for the deer, right? Because the deer like the camas. And so, you know, you might have five times as much camas a year after you gathered from that patch because you've spread it out. But now you've created uh, more food for deer and they concentrate on that patch. And then your hunters can go to that place and hunt more effectively because there's more camas over time. And so you bring deer closer to your village. Um, you get all of these sorts of abundance cycles that sort of by an action of not taking everything. Um, and I think that some of those inspirations about practice and thinking about the ways of this work, um, to me, that is one of the directions that I wanna see. I wanna see more of that in our monuments. Um, some of the challenges, of course, that I've seen, and I've been a part of some of these different dialogue conversations about toppling of statues and others, and that relates to community work, you know, people deciding what a community is going to be and what they want it to be. And, you know, I encourage the, those dialogues, those conversations. Some of the challenges that I've seen in some of my work um, is a real challenge with the idea that there is a lifespan of something uh, and an admittance to that. And John uh, really kind of referenced this a little bit about like the static expectations of monuments and that they're supposed to stay in one place. And that idea seems so foreign from a tribal perspective. And I see that even more so with um, different totem poles that have been erected. Totem poles aren't native to our people. We had a different art form here, but nevertheless, these totem poles popped up all over the Northwest in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And what's happened over time is people didn't do what our ancestors to the North did with their totem poles, where they let them lay out and desiccate and rot, right? They had a life. What they've tried to do is they try to sustain them by injecting them full of like chemicals and spray things. And like they become toxic wastes, which in and of themselves don't represent what they're supposed to stand for. Right, and to me, that's like absolute lack of authenticity to what this cultural practice is. Like what would be appropriate is carving and erecting a new pole when the other one wasn't there, not injecting it full of awful chemicals to the point where you, know, you can't even get the landfill to accept it. Um, that is some of the problems that we're seeing as people have to confront 
you know, what is the lifespan of this? And maybe we can look to some of our engineer friends who will tell you no matter what, any infrastructure has a planned lifespan. It's not indefinite. And we need to bring that into art and monuments and we need to plan for it. Um, you know, another real challenge that we have is that, you know, there's many monuments and, you know, as people open their minds and their hearts and seek to understand the story of marginalized and oppressed peoples like our people, over 98% of all of our people died between 1750 and 1850. Um, you know, when settlers first arrived, they were experiencing a post-apocalyptic world here in the Willamette Valley, right? They couldn't imagine that we had trade economies and abundance and wealth in this place because there were so few people left from all the disease that came from Europeans across the continent. Um, and so a part of that is that as we do this work, you know, and I, I heard Michael mention this as well, it's not so much this conversation of not telling the history or the story, but the important value for me is that things being outside lend them a certain amount of veneration and acceptance and representation. And I think something that's far more appropriate for something that a s groups of citizens or community decide is no longer reflective of them and doesn't deserve that veneration is to actually put them indoors, right? Put them in a museum, tell that story as if it's something static in the past. It's been captured. Um, that's something for us as tribal people, we also have a conflicted relationship with museums. Um, and that's an aspect of what's important to us is the living, right? It's the practices. You keep things going. You keep things living. You don't try to capture it and hold it in place. Um, and to that end, um, some of this work around monuments, to me, is trying to capture that you know, authenticity of place, but then also to celebrate living practices and actions. And there's been some really good and strong examples of that. One is the work um, by Maya Lin as a part of the Confluence Project at the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, it's a basalt uh, fish station where fish can be butchered. And it's at a prominent fishing location that has been a fishing location since time immemorial for tribal people and non-tribal people use it today. So you think about that idea of it being a unifying element of place that's commonly understood and accessed by all different peoples, even if it's rooted in a native past. To me, that's like immensely powerful and strong way to like think of monuments and celebration of place and practice. Um, another example is actually very much in Eugene. Uh, it's at Mount Pisgah. Uh, you know, Pete Helzer's bronze work that's at the top of Mount Pisgah. It does this work of facilitating understanding of place. You know, different alignments allow you to see the sunrise at the solstice. There's uh, actual designs in and of itself that talk about knowledge and information. It's a tool that guides um, a greater understanding of the environment around. While that is, doesn't have anything to do with tribal history, I think what it does is there's an element of place that's really powerful about that. Um, it's not a perfect alignment for my thoughts, but because it's in Eugene, I thought I would bring it up and it's close to many of you. And if you've never had the chance to go up there, you should definitely take the opportunity. Um, those are my initial comments. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to be able to engage in dialogue with our other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, John, Michael, David. Now let's engage, let's talk a little bit together about how these ideas work. So John, you talked about certain things that we, that the memory works, things that we don't want to remember, but we need to remember, the not happy things. Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, there's a couple things I think we can say. Um, and partly this comes out of the, the critique of a lot of these monuments where people are saying, well, we, we you know, we, you're, you're, you're destroying history. Um, we can't destroy history. We need to learn from it. And there's a nugget of, of truth in there. But one of the things that interests me is there, there are histories that we deliberately, that are, there are terrible histories that we have deliberately tried to remember. 
and um, and that that's another area for monuments and memorials is how do we how do we create a way to remember those things? So you know, the Holocaust obviously is one of the big ones. Um, slavery, um, the genocide of indigenous peoples in this country. You know, we don't want monuments that that honor or celebrate any of these things, but they they do call for historical work so that people will remember and never repeat them. And so I think that that's an interesting um, challenge for the for the dialogue um, that that is is right now. And um, when I was in the uh, Portland Art Commission, now it's the Regional Art Commission, has a different name. One of the things that happened is we um, were in the midst of a process of of the city was creating a um, a memorial to the Japanese internment during the Second World War. And um, this is, you know, one of the awful aspects of American history. 120,000 citizens were, um, you know, illegally interned uh, and their livelihoods and businesses taken away from them. Um, and the, one of the people who was behind this was a Portland businessman, um, Bill Nato. And he was interned in one of the camps as a teenager. And it was very important to him that this um, monument or memorial be created um, to remind people of, of this fact. And he actually, the form of it, he wanted, he, he said when we were doing that, he said, it has to be something that a teenager can understand. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't want um, a Vietnam Memorial, which I think is a tremendous memorial, but he didn't want something that was abstract like that. He wanted something that you could understand if you were a teenager. And I think it was, um, significant that that's the age that he was when um, he was subjected to that. I think that's a great point, John. And um, I, I especially appreciate your point about remembering atrocities and the really ugly points of history in a way that is remembering the victims, those who, who were injured or worse. Uh, and in many ways, if we held up a monument of uh, the persecutor as a way of remembering history, well, it's still privileging that perspective on history. It's still valorizing that person. And it is certainly complicated when we're looking at our local uh, monuments, especially monuments to pioneerism, because not every pioneer was necessarily bad. And if you look at individual histories, there may have been individuals that were actually quite good, even as they benefited from a, a system of white suprem supremacy and oppression. And so that I think is the challenge when we're confronting our monument or reckoning with our monuments one by one is interrogating what they really symbolize. And when they are more symbolic, as in the case of a pioneer father, some, some generic individual, then there's a lot more that's wrapped up in that narrative. Um, and to, to David's point um, earlier about um, the, the temporality of monuments and the material life and culture of those monuments, in some ways, uh, we, we give ourselves more problems by creating monuments that are so incredibly durable. Had they, had they been less durable, then they could actually decay along with those older world views. And so then the act of, of moving that monument, reinterpreting it, um, et cetera, that action um, becomes as weighty as the original construction of the old monument or a construction of a new monument. Um, it's actually, quite a lengthy process to even decide what happens. But what, what do we do with these now? Yeah, I want to join on to that if I can and just talk about um, the when things stretch on over time, you're dealing with like different audiences of people and that depending on where an audience is, you can have certain conversations especially if it's a minority viewpoint that just isn't sort of universally understood. The idea of like coming in and making a huge splash and building something that doesn't make sense can potentially be really challenging. And one of the things that I face in a lot of my work around cultural resources, tribal identity, both with non-tribal people, which is expected, but also tribal people, which is unexpected for others, is around shame. Right. And so when you talk about these really 
challenging experiences, time, and how that works, people shut down. And when people shut down, they're not necessarily engaging. Like they actually opt out and don't participate in the knowing and the learning. And so to me, you know, that proximity and time to an event, that proximity and like a general community knowledge of knowing, like the way to responsibly go about do something, doing something is that knowing your audience and knowing what conversations you can have so that you're informing or educating people, but not to the point where they're shutting down and experiencing shame. I regularly find, and whether it's talks that I give or work that I do, if I'm, it's very easy to fall into that as a tribal person, as somebody who, you know, what a compelling narrative. I don't need to do that work, partially because of all the work that my ancestors have done before me, right? So I'm on those building blocks and instead, I'm trying to translate like worldview of tribal people because I think that we have an audience that's ready to hear some of those things. 20, 30 years ago, that work wouldn't have made sense. Other types of work would have been needed. So I, I'm trying to get at that like translation through time. And I completely agree, Michael, if only we made things out of paper mache, it'd be perfect. I, um, I want to, uh, uh, say also, David, uh, your ideas about um, different ways of doing memory work that are based in place. I think that's an incredibly powerful idea. And um, I, I, it would be wonderful to figure out ways to do that in, in some sort of through both civic organizations and through schools to incorporate that into the, the pedagogy, if you will, um, because it does it is so important to relate to the to place that, that we're in as we do think about, you know, the natural world and the situation of the climate crisis. Um, that's fundamentally, you know, about how, how we're taking care of the place. And if we don't, if we don't understand that, we have no hope of, of doing good work in that area. So I, I, that's a kind of a, it's not a monument monument, but it, it's, it's a way to envision doing this work that I think is, is, is really very, um, very exciting. David, tell us, tell us a little bit more about that Mount Pisgah point you made earlier about how it transcends somehow. Yeah, I think I can build that too and what John was talking about, but I'm starting quite to question like within that worldview of landscapes, often it seems like one of the translations that's needed in the world today is a destination, right? Which is like having a destination or a tool in a place in order to do that, whether that's a, a sign, right? When you're looking at a horizon and it shows the peaks and it has the name to it so you can identify what it is. Um, or it's a view shed, um, which reminds me of, you know, something that our ancestors did um, in high promontory places was actually stack rock features that would be horseshoe shaped and point towards prominent locations. So you're supposed to sit inside of this horseshoe shaped rock wall or circular rings that had apertures through the rocks that pointed at certain things. And so, you know, to me, it's like creating that destination. And that is there work that we can do today through the tool of monuments and rethinking our monuments to create the destination that then facilitates somebody using that information to talk with others about it. And that whole concept is what really inspired me to mention the work on top of Mount Pisgah, because that does that in a very non-tribal aspect, but in like a scientific astronomy, science kind of path of learning. And uh, I think that that, you know, it's creating a monument in a place uh, that then is used by the public to kind of understand what's going on. Although maybe some people don't even understand that, right? It's not like there's a guide to these things as well, it, it doesn't need to be self-explanatory. Sometimes you need somebody to help you um, or you ask the question, it prompts something of search and finding. David, that, that really reminds me of um, the, the concept of palimpsest in landscape architecture, uh, which is the idea that just like you might be able to have read text on old stone writings that had been uh, glossed over and, re and reused as a material, 
that in the landscape, you can find history. Um, it, it might be marginal, that it might be, um, that it might be hidden, but that through the process of, of design and placemaking, those marks can be very visible and, and powerful as, as monuments in their, themselves. Um, and I think uh, that is, it, it begs the question as to um, the importance of the sites of monuments after monuments are removed or, or changed, how that as a place uh, in, imbued with importance and meaning um, can still express its, its significance as a, as a historic site, even as the significant symbol that was there evolves or has changed. Something about thinking about these and try to a way that it would make sense for our ancestors is like, you know, petroglyphs is something that's more common as sort of something that's left behind to guide people's kind of understanding or, or celebrate or denote a special event or thing that occurred. Um, and then we also have like culturally modified trees, you know, at events where important things took place, you'd take a sapling and modify it in certain ways. Sometimes there are wayfinding, sometimes there's others. And, you know, we still have some of those in the valley where you'll have, you know, 200, 300 year old trees and they still show signs of this like different modification. But as it's gotten older, it's sort of a, mon it's, it's a monument in a weird way, right? Like it wasn't intended to be the way that we think of it now, but now it sort of means something entirely different 300 years later. It's sort of a, um, a holdout of, of the meaning that people were here before us that had different values and different practices. But then it still had this like very functional part of either denoting a significant occurrence or event or um, I just think about how our ancestors would, you know, how, how this concept maybe worked its way, how it was manifest 300 years ago in the valley. I was thinking about, um, well, two things. One is that as, as the incomers, the more recent incomers, figure out they can't keep living on the land as if the land had no properties of its own, so we keep adjusting the land to meet our needs, that we would learn how to live more with the land, and that would put us in better alignment with some of our indigenous neighbors who have done that before us. Um, but then you know, think about the Vietnam Memorial, uh, for a piece of stone, it does a real nice job of reminding us that this was about a whole bunch of people who died each on, together or apart on a given day of the war in Vietnam. It really, it really reminds us of the stuff we wish we could forget. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it is, uh, you know, an art with a message that you wish you didn't have to get, but if you don't get it, you'll do it again. Mm -hmm. And it was so controversial when it was first opened, and then um, it actually became um, so kind of important as a kind of pilgrimage site. Um, it's an interesting case in the history of, of memorials in this case in the United States, um, you know, I think to this day. It'll be interesting, it'll be different when the generations that experienced that firsthand are no longer there. It will, it will become a different piece. Uh, I have a question for the other presenters, which is, um, do, is a future direction of monuments like community input, like the work that John spoke about with uh, the Monument Lab in Philadelphia? Like, is that the future direction? Uh, will it kind of be business as usual in some ways, or is that the new standard? It's a good question. Um, I, I, I suspect, and this is just a guess, I, I suspect part of what has happened is notions of the monument have receded somewhat and notions of public sculpture, if you want to call it that, have moved to the forefront. And the works that you see in the monument lab, a lot of them are by artists that are using that public sculpture opportunity to, to say something 
which is um, socially significant. I mean, they're thinking about, it's not like, it's not self-expression particularly other than, well, they're talking about their, their own sort of values. Um, but it is something that's different than a kind of the, the civic monument that we used to see in the past. Although those are still getting erected. So um, they don't get a lot of press, but um, I think because they're so old fashioned, quite frankly, but you still do see fairly new old fashioned monuments turning up. I think though the last, you know, two years, six months have shifted the dialogue a lot and um, we'll see what happens. I think there's a lot more questions being asked now about sort of how do we, how could we do this if we wanted to? We know we want to take something down. No one knows exactly what could be put up or if even anything should be put up, which is part of what I think. I don't know, in some, as I say, it's a culturally specific practice that, um, it's possible that the culture that practiced that doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Time for us to wrap up. We're going to run out of time. We'll see. Final words. I just want to thank everybody for, for all of your ideas and thoughts. And Mary, thanks for inviting us. This was um, really thought provoking and I was privileged to, to be here. Uh, thank you yeah. for uh, having me. And I guess I just want to encourage people to, you know, look to place and, seeking authenticity of place um, as a way of a unifying thread to connect people uh, today as well as through time. Yeah, I also want to uh, thank the other speakers for uh, sharing their time and their perspectives. Uh, I think we're about to enter a very exciting time for the reconsideration of monuments and, and our history, um, a time that's um, already begun. Uh, this period has already begun. And um, I think there is great opportunities if we seek to provide a more inclusive space for uh, telling our shared stories. Thank you, John, Michael, David, and the people whose introductions led me to you. While following these leads, I came across others with a keen interest in the topic including Ellen Tykeson, Kate Ali from the Oregon Arts Commission, Betsy Woolston of Wolf Works Studio, and Dan Chen of Dan Chen Art. They're hoping we have another program about making the art that embodies the messages of the community, whom they hear and how they transform an idea. Their program suggestion is a perfect example of how messages get priority. Some messages get priority while others never get heard because the chain of referrals doesn't reach them. Whom we get to meet in our social circles can have can be a powerful influence on whose ideas get shared. In the next few months, City Club will also be joining in conversations with other organizations and individuals to enlarge the pool of monumental ideas and perhaps promote some collaborative projects, exhibitions maybe, in, to inspire us now. We are interested in hearing from anyone in the community who'd like to propose or participate in an activity designed to push our thinking about monuments and memorials. Perhaps some student artists would like to engage this topic. Ellen says we need to provide a curriculum and so we will. We could provide materials to help inform the work. Email us at cityclubofeugene at gmail.com, cityclubofeugene at gmail.com. The early conversations about this program reminded me of a poem by Robert Frost written in the Roaring Twenties. Perhaps it is helpful to remember it as we continue the American tradition of melting down the relics of the past and we move on ahead together. Nothing gold can stay. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. Thank you. This has been our November 6, 2020 program, Reimagining Monuments. Before we proceed, I'd like to recognize some gold sponsors, Pacific Cascade Federal Credit Union, Jerry Detelm, Architect, Landscape Architect, and AARP of Oregon. 
It is our expectation to have these taped conversations available by Fridays at noon. We want to thank you all for supporting us during this difficult time. Before we thank our speakers today, there are a few quick announcements. Thank you to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, PAC Info and Simplified Computing, LLC, Dot Dotson's Photography, and Network Charter School. And a special thank you to public radio station KLCC 89.7 for airing City Club programs on Mondays at 7 p.m. And thank you to Community Television of Lane County, Cable Channel 29, for televising recent City Club programs. Our programs are always available on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. Next week, we will talk about fire on the river before, during, and after the Holiday Farm Fire. Speakers will include the McKinsey River Trust, Joe Mall, U.S. Forest Service Research Hydrologist, Gordon Grant, and the United Way's Jared Pruk. The session will be moderated by Karin Knudsen. You may send questions for upcoming programs to the City Club's Executive Director. The program's moderator will select the questions to be asked for each program. Please send your questions to administrator at cityclubofeugene.org. Please join us again next Friday. More details and information about future programs can be found online at the City Club's website, cityclubofeugene.org. Now, I would like to thank today's speakers for a great program. Moderator Mary Layton, John Weber, Michael Giffel, and David Harrelson. Thanks for a great program. This con concludes today's forum. Be well and stay safe.